my name's Olivia Hilton and I was a graduate from Bath Spa. I finished in 2020, um, was just about to finish up on my course and we got told that we sadly had to go home because of the pandemic. So I was within that group of people. Um, and here I am now uh, celebrating Black History Month with you. Um, so this is my talk titled Black Female and Animated, Breaking Barriers in the Animation Industry. Um, we've only got an hour, so it's going to be a sort of a whistle-stop tour of the community of black women that are currently working in animation. So it's going to start off with a little introduction to this figure here. Um, this is Brenda Banks, and she was one of the first known black female animators. She was quite a silent force in the industry. She was quite private, so not a lot is really known about her, even though she worked on some of our favourite um, animated series and films from the 70s all the way into the 2000s. Um, she's best known for her work on Ralph Bakshi's groundbreaking indie features. Um, she arrived at his studio in 1973 asking for a job, even though she told him that she had no background in animation. Um, but she really impressed. So it's a little compilation here. I won't show you the whole thing, but just as a little insight into some of the things that Brenda <laughs> on for quite some time but if you search Brenda Banks on YouTube and you want to know a bit more about what she's done you can find the full thing there um, but as you can see she pioneered quite a lot of early um, children's how do we full screen this again That's all right, no worries. Um, so I know what every film animation student loves, 
percentages. <laughs> um, <laughs> so 1%, 2%, 3%, 5%, 5%, what do these figures mean? And what are they reflective of in the industry today? So 1% in the industry today are women of colour animated film directors. 2% are women of colour animated TV directors. 3% are women of colour animated characters in film. And 5% are women of colour producers in animation. Now, a couple of things to note is that obviously, first of all, this just states women of colour. Doesn't necessarily give us a breakdown of, you know, it could be black, Asian, Latina. Um, and this study was done in 2019, and these were the latest figures I could find, which I think says a lot of, about <laughs> the interest in finding out about this community of people that work in our industry. Um, and how sadly maybe things haven't changed that much since Brenda came about. Um, but it's not all doom and gloom. Um, here's a little bit about me and how I ended up here. Who am I? Um, so as I said before, my name's Olivia. This is me when I was <laughs> little. Um, I'm a daughter to, um, my dad was from Jamaica. My mum is English. This was me in school. Um, this was my bully in school. Um, that picture kind of summarises the demographic that I experienced. Um, it was a very small town and I didn't really see myself in any of my classmates at the time. However, I then went to a school in the city um, where I met some amazing black women who taught me that I shouldn't brush my hair every day. Um, <laughs> that I need to use coconut oil. And this is my best friend, Salome, who still makes me laugh like this to this day. Um, I graduated from here in 2020. Um, we had our ceremony, I believe, last year due to COVID. Um, and I did film, TV and digital production. And this is me now, not very flattering photo, but I work on Moomin Valley, um, and that's little Moomin Troll and my friend Tom, who's a very talented artist. So that's a little bit about me. Um, but how did I end up in animation if I did film and TV production? What led me to being in animation? It all started with ballet, oddly enough. Um, I was a performer when I was younger, which led me down various paths of singing and acting, dancing. Um, but as I sort of reached my teen years, I soon realised that there's not really a huge amount of opportunity, or back then there wasn't a huge amount of opportunity for people that looked like me. In ballet, I got older and my hips came in and my butt came in and there weren't that many black ballet dancers <laughs> at the time. Um, and then my opinion shifted slightly to more wanting to be the person behind the lens, behind the camera, to create those opportunities and to create that space for people who look like me. After graduating um, in 2020, I was still working a part-time job at Hollister for six months. It did take some time for me to get my first job. Um, and I landed my first job on the BBC four-part production drama, The Girl Before. It was purely by luck. I had put my CV everywhere I could think of. And the producer called me early January um, and said, oh, we're, we're looking for local crew. What do you want to do? So I was like, oh my gosh, like, <laughs> this is really overwhelming. So I started off as a production runner and then also tried a little bit of um, art department as well, but ended up sticking with production. Um, I think I naturally excelled at the organisational aspect of things. Um, it was a hell of a shoot and I <laughs> learned later on that things that happened there and the way that certain people behaved weren't up to standard and weren't particularly normal um, but saying that I spoke to everyone there I was there from the beginning to end so I met all the crew made lots of links and it really is who you know and just putting out a good impression of yourself and being genuine and kind and helpful led me to my next job, which was on War of the Worlds, um, 
uh, produced by Urban Myth over in Newport. Um, it was a much, much bigger crew. We had two units, um, and I was production secretary for one of those units. Um, it was huge, a very, very different atmosphere to working on The Girl Before. Didn't really have those sort of interpersonal relationships between departments. Um, but it was during the sort of wrap up of War of the Worlds so that I took a gamble and um, applied for a job at Ardman that I saw. It was a step down, but I thought, well, let's try it out. Um, and I got the job as a puppet wrangler on Chicken Run 2, um, which just had its premiere at the weekend. Um, so I was a puppet wrangler for about six months, and it's still, and I think will always be, the best job. Um, it was crazy. I basically just looked after chickens, like little chickens all day, like they were my little family. And it was a perfect mix, I think, if you're looking for a job that's, um, you're on the floor, you're taking part in the production, but at the same time, you're also organising and having to do admin type stuff as well. Um, and I really, I really did love it, but honestly, the pay wasn't great. So I did take a promotion when they offered it to me to a puppet coordinator, and I stayed in that role for another year um, before moving on to uh, Moomin Valley. Um, and it wasn't until I sort of made the switch into Moomin Valley with Gutsy Animations um, that I realised that a lot of my passions when I was younger were coming back to me and that I realised, gosh, I really do like this angle of working for children and putting out content for children because whether we like it or not, children are going to consume media and what they see um, is, a really, is really important, is really important. Um, and Tove's stories are timeless and I just really love this show a lot. <laughs> So that's where I am today, working on the final season of Moomin Valley. Anyway, enough about me. Um, for the realities of being a black woman in animation, um, it's not as sort of virtuous and ground, like I kind of wanted to be this powerful figure that comes in and switches things up and, but it's really, not like that once you get somewhere. You're a bit of a unicorn and not everyone has the same interest. And obviously I can only speak from my experience. I am a light-skinned black woman. The experiences of dark-skinned black women are completely different. Um, so I'm only speaking on my experiences here. But when I talk about challenges, I also like to talk about opportunities because when we acknowledge challenges, we have to acknowledge hope. There is so much discourse about the struggle that we have, but that can often make us feel kind of hopeless and like, oh, we do have it bad and blah, blah, blah. But actually that doesn't really help black women in general because it's not offering those opportunities or solutions on how we can work through it and make it better. Um, so just a few things that I have experienced working as a black woman in animation is diversity, dishonesty, unconscious bias, toxic excellence, imposter syndrome, and burnout. So with diversity, dishonesty, you often find that a lot of companies are very public facing um, with their diversity. And actually, once you get into the company, a lot of people of color, especially black women, are in junior roles or temporary roles. Um, unconscious bias is a tricky one because obviously, it's unconscious, but everyone has their positive and negative biases towards certain groups of people. And it's really important that um, when you're working for someone, you do the relevant training or you suggest it. Um, toxic excellence is kind of just a thing I made up in my head of this thing that black people have to be excellent. We have to be truly amazing, we can't afford to mess up or make a mistake. Um, and that can lead to burnout and feelings of imposter syndrome, like we're not doing enough. Um, but these are sort of the three mantras I try and say to myself is respect your voice, respect your time and respect your growth. 
Now, this works whether you're a black woman or not. Um, if you're noticing some area of improvement in your workplace or in your friend group or whatever, and you have the power and the confidence to make that change, then you can say something. Um, your opinion is valid. Um, respect your time. I haven't respected my time in a lot of instances early on in my career, um, doing a lot of unpaid overtime, hopping on the diversity and inclusion um, activities and doing overtime in that sense and actually not getting acknowledged for it. And also respect your growth. Like I touched on earlier, it's okay to make mistakes. You will make mistakes um, and you can't always be perfect. Um, and here are a couple of resources that I would encourage you to look into or share with any friends that you might think are interested. Um, so The Line did a really interesting conversation as a company about race in animation. Um, and it's on YouTube and it's about three hours worth of it and it's really, really interesting. Black Women Animate are a um, black owned company um, and they consciously hire black women and train them up and help companies. They've partnered with Disney, Paramount to hire uh, black women. Um, Babasa is a Bristol based company. Um, they, again, they offer training to people of underrepresented backgrounds and they um, put companies in touch with those people as well. And if you're interested in animation yourself, Secret Story Draw um, is for people of underrepresented groups. You enter a competition to create a storyboard. Um, companies will partner with Secret Story Draw to pick their favourite and then hire you as a intern and you get paid. Um, so, as I just touched on, Black Women Animate. This is the wonderful founder of Black Women Animate, Taylor K. Shaw. Um, they consciously hire women of colour. Um, they've worked with Pixar, Disney and Paramount. And she also has a personal newsletter called Self Portrait. Um, in her own words, one of the biggest challenges facing women of colour and non-binary creatives of colour is access to production companies and studios who can employ them and or whom they can pitch their original content to. Without artist community, we are breaking down the walls, walls that separate us, creating access, building bridges, getting people meaningful work, doing what they love. So Black Women Animate came about when Taylor herself was producing a series, I think in 2017, about black women in Chicago. And she was looking for black creatives and there wasn't really a network. Um, she knew that black animators were out there, but how do you find them? Um, so that's why she created Black Women Animate. Um, so I'm just going to show you a clip of some of the work that they have done. This was a piece uh, commissioned by Hulu and a great example of creating your own space within the space. When you think of Coretta Scott King, you probably think of the wife of a slain civil rights leader and a single mother of four. But that's Mrs. King. We're here to talk about Coretta, a fierce fighter and courageous leader, the woman you don't know. When Coretta was a child, she dreamed of becoming a singer, of leaving her small Alabama town and performing at the Metropolitan Opera and breaking down barriers for the black community. She was on her way when she fell in love with a minister who shared her vision of a future where all of humanity lived in peace. But she didn't stop singing. For years, she held freedom concerts all over the U.S. that raised money to support the civil rights movement. And between singing classical songs and traditional spirituals, she spoke about the world she was helping build. Coretta was raised to see the best in others and that acting in anger was never a solution. Even though growing up, she and her family were constantly subjected to racist attacks, 
When the Scots' home was burned to the ground, Coretta's father told her and her siblings to forgive the people who did it. His determination to not let other people's hate define his actions stuck with Coretta. At Antioch College, Coretta was politically active and joined the peace movement. She made it a priority in the following decades to oppose nuclear weapons and the Vietnam War. Coretta took part in rallies, protests, and marches, and was often invited to speak in the U.S. and abroad. You who will not be deluded by a talk of peace, but who press on in the knowledge that the work of peacemaking must continue until the last gun is silent. Now, just because Coretta worked for peace doesn't mean she was passive. When she got married in 1953, she removed Obey from her wedding vows but she always supported her husband and the civil rights movement. Like in 1956, when their house in Montgomery was bombed, nearly killing Coretta, her friend Mary, and her infant daughter Yolanda. Coretta's father wanted her to leave town. Coretta refused. Her resolve to stay and support the cause empowered her husband to continue leading the Montgomery bus boycott to victory. It was this dedication that helped Coretta carry on after her husband was assassinated. Only days after his death, she returned to Memphis with three of her four children to take his place in a march supporting sanitation workers. If we can catch the spirit, which I believe and the true meaning of it, this experience, I believe that this nation can be transformed into a society of love, of justice, peace and brotherhood. Coretta's support of workers' rights and unions grew as she carried the torch for the civil rights movement. She expanded her view of what true freedom meant and took on many causes to get at the roots of inequality and conflict. I remind you that starving a child is violence. Suppressing a culture is violence. Neglecting school children is violence. Punishing a mother and her child is violence. Discrimination against a working man is violence. Ghetto housing is violence. Ignoring medical needs is violence. Contempt for poverty is violence. Even the lack of willpower to help humanity is a sick and sinister form of violence. As with her opposition to the Vietnam War, Coretta wasn't afraid of taking on causes that weren't popular. Starting in the 1970s, she was outspoken about gay rights, even when some around her didn't want to hear it. I've always felt that homophobic attitudes and policies were unjust and unworthy of a free society and must be opposed by all Americans who believe in democracy. Coretta kept up her activism for her entire life working with politicians, world leaders, and countless organizations to fight for gun control, oppose the Iraq War and apartheid, and poverty and joblessness, and so much more. In 1986, she wrote a letter which helped block Jeff Sessions from becoming a federal judge. 30 years later, that same letter was read by Elizabeth Warren to oppose his confirmation as attorney general. Mitch McConnell had Warren silenced and made the now famous complaint. Nevertheless, she persisted. Coretta died in 2006, but she probably would have liked that rallying cry. Her entire life is a testament to that statement, especially in her tireless efforts to preserve and expand her husband's legacy and the beliefs they both held dear by getting his birthday declared a national holiday and building the Martin Luther King Jr. Center for Nonviolent Social Change. Both achievements took years of Coretta planning and lobbying, and ignoring her naysayers. But nevertheless, Coretta persisted. We honor her husband and the Civil Rights Movement the third Monday of every January, and the King Center welcomes over one million visitors a year who want to learn about nonviolence and work for a better world. Everything Coretta did came from a place of love and empathy, to unite people in a beloved community, which is what she called a place of true respect, love, and justice that transcends race, color, or creed. She once wrote, The road to the beloved community is the road of nonviolence. The roadblocks are hate and prejudice. We are not there yet, but there are more doors open than ever before. We stand on the cusp of a new day, one brimming with possibilities. Cool. 
So it's one of the pieces by BWA, and I think it's a really good example that, how do I, sorry, how do I get it? I think this again. you go back again, so if you just press escape, and then ah, I see. Yeah. Cool. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, I think this is a really good example of not necessarily trying to fit into a white space, but creating your own space. So, little exercise in your heads. Name an animated black female character. Points if any of these came up but most likely the most famous example that you'll probably think of is Miss Tiana. Now, Tiana from Princess and the Frog is a bit of a controversial one. Although it was Disney's first black princess, she was a frog for most of the movie. <laughs> so, <laughs> Tiana exemplified the epitome of what life told us it meant to be as a strong black woman, responsible, a bit sassy, and dedicated to her family. She was fiercely independent with a story that sung a soulful song of the honor and pressure felt by black women to fulfill the dreams of their loved ones, safeguard their culture, and place the needs of others before their own. Our princess with beautiful cocoa flesh, a wide nose and slicked up hair, charmed all of the little black girls and grown black women who longed to see a princess they could relate to grace the screen. We tried to be hopeful witnessing the first black princess in pixels, but we were very quickly reminded that the world refuses to view us with such grandeur. She was a problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, like I said, a bit of a controversial one. Um, and I think that is just the, due down to the fact that it's a Disney production and Disney is a largely white space. Yes, they have black animators, um, but that's where unconscious bias comes to play, I think. Um, so why does representation matter both on screen and behind screen? Stereotypes promote a narrow understanding, especially of underrepresented communities. Positive representation can help shift public opinion Hashtag first time I saw me, which was a um, Netflix uh, initiative that shared the stories of people who shared the first time that they saw themselves on screen. And I'll touch on this in a later slide, um, but it really highlighted that it's not necessarily about the color of your skin, your race. Gender plays a part in it. Sexuality plays a part in it. Um, and that first moment where you see yourself on screen really sticks with you your whole life. Children can't be what they can't see. I feel like, you know, I'm preaching to the choir a little bit and that we know that children um, develop off what they see in their parents, at school, and also on screen. Positive representation can increase self-esteem and identity for both children, young adults, and adults. For children, it can help shape their identity. For young adults, even more so. And then for adults, it kind of affirms our identity if we see someone that we identify with on screen. Um, the media shapes and reflects our society. So I think this kind of encaps encapsulates everything. Um, my favorite buzzword, <laughs> intersectionality. Um, so what I was saying from that previous slide, um, intersectionality um, is the acknowledgement that, not, that everyone has their own unique experiences when it comes to oppression and we have to consider everything from gender, race, um, socioeconomic background, sexuality, etc. Not every black woman who works in animation, whether that be an animator or in production, is going to have the same experiences. So when you just employ one black woman on your team, that's not, that's not enough. <laughs> Identity shapes storytelling and intersectionality shapes more authentic narratives. The more reflective of a team we have of our society, 
the more authentic our storytelling is going to be because it's more accurate to what we see in everyday life. Um, so here's someone who I'm personally a fan of and would like to gush about. Um, Cat Black um, is a trans animator, illustrator and YouTuber. She created The Power of Words, which was committed, uh, commissioned by YouTube Originals when it existed, and also Sometimes You're a Caterpillar. Um, through trials and tribulations, she catalogues the complicated nature of wanting a private life of safety while also wanting to be the representation she desperately needed as a child, as an adult. And that was something that really resonated with me. Um, so I'd just like to show you the last bit of technical um, trouble we'll have. When I was younger, I always knew that I was different. And when I would close my eyes, it was almost impossible for me to imagine what my future would be. I mean, I would literally close my eyes and I couldn't think of anything. I didn't really have the words for it when I was younger, but to some degree, I knew that I was transgender and I didn't really know what that looked like. When I was growing up, there weren't very many examples of who transgender people could be as adults. Because I had such a hard time envisioning who I could be, I felt like it was important for me to write down who I am right now. And I bought this journal, and it was the beginning of me having a dialogue with myself. This journal was the very beginning of me becoming a blogger. As a kid, I kept a journal for a really long time, and as I moved into teenager times, um, I went through what a lot of teenagers went through. I was angsty, I was, you know, depressed and scared. And back then, blogs were becoming a thing. And I just thought that I would take my journal and make it into a public online diary. And so I started my first little blog and I started using it the way that I would use my old journal. I would just come home every day and write about what was going on in my day. And it, it kind of gained a bit of a following. And through my own little blog, I started actually having a little bit of a community. And it was really great to sort of meet people from around the world who were having similar experiences as I was. A lot of people who followed my blog told me that I should go and start a YouTube page. And so every week, my parents would give me $25 for allowance. And usually I would go and spend this on Sims expansion packs. But one time I decided to go and actually get a webcam and I started a YouTube channel. And I used my YouTube channel the way that I used my public diary. I would come home every day from school and just speak to it and just talk right into the camera. But because it was such a touchy conversation for me, I really wanted to keep it secret. I didn't want my, my friends or my family or my classmates to know anything about my little blog. And, you know, back then YouTube was definitely not what it is today. There was no such thing as being a YouTuber. I was just somebody who had a YouTube page. So in high school, I was an eccentric art kid. I was in theater. I hand painted most of my t-shirts. Like I was just that kid. My big goal at that point in my life was to get into CalArts, which was my dream school. It's a school that was started by Disney. And back then, all I wanted to do was be an animator. And so most of my time was spent with me doing my portfolio, which was at one point in time, the main topic of my YouTube channel. Now, I will say that I was a little popular in school. I figured that people knew me because I was in theater. And I didn't find out until I was about to graduate high school that literally everyone watched my YouTube channel. And my YouTube channel was peak teenage angst. It was me gossiping. It was a lot of stuff that I didn't think people were looking at. But by the time I was in my senior year, I already knew that I was going to CalArts. And so I was really excited to embark on this brand new journey in a whole new place where I knew absolutely nobody. Now, the coolest thing about college is once you get there, you realize that you have no responsibility to be the person who you said you were the day before. It forced me to really think about who I was. While I'd always kind of known that I was transgender, it was really my first year in college where I knew that I was a trans woman. Um, and of course that presented a bunch of complications because specifically being a black trans woman is scary. And I knew that transition would paint a target on my back, but I had to move forward with my authenticity and truly be who I knew myself to be. So back then, YouTube was very important to me. I needed a place to vent and I needed a place to share all of the things that I was experiencing in that strange point of my life. 
So year after year after year, I progressed in my transition. And by my last year of college, I had legally changed my name to Catherine. One of the big reasons why I wanted to change my name before I graduated college was because I, at the time, was very, very invested in stealth. In the early days when I started reading about trans life, the story kind of went like this. You figured out that you were trans, you started taking hormones from you know some person on the streets, your body started changing, you got a bunch of surgeries, you eventually got the surgery, you killed everybody who ever knew you before, who knew who you used to be, moved to another state, and then you, you know, married a man and fell in love and now you're writing this account from, you know, your white picket fenced house where you've got 2.5 children and a dog and your life is just perfect. I mean, all of that with the exception of obviously killing everybody. But there was, that was the narrative. The narrative was that you were transitioning to disappear, to not be seen so that nobody knew that you were trans because that would just make your life easier. I wanted to be able to go through my life only being known as Catherine. So after college, I moved back in with my parents and my parents had moved to a totally new town. Um, and in that town, I was able to be stealth. I was able to exist in a way where nobody knew that I was transgender. I worked in the animation industry for a little bit of time. And it's kind of funny, you know, when you go to the top school for animation in the country, the likelihood of you avoiding people who you went to college with is pretty slim. So I figured out pretty quickly that stealth in the animation industry was not only kind of impossible for me, but also really irrelevant because animation really is one of those things where they really do care about what you do and less about who you are. And so going into the animation industry was actually one of the first times I recognized that maybe I didn't need to be stealth. Maybe that wasn't the most important thing in the world for me. So after working in the animation industry for a bit, I kind of recognized that it wasn't for me, which of course was a really upsetting realization to have when I'd worked so hard to get there. So I went back home and I did a bunch of children's illustration for a bit. And after that, I went back to YouTube. And by the time I returned to YouTube, YouTube was a totally different platform, like a completely different thing. Being a YouTuber was a thing you could be. When I started back up on YouTube, it was this weird thing where I was trying to, on one hand, remain stealth, but also have enough of a following to where I could kind of make a little bit of money um, and sort of sustain myself a little bit. Um, and of course, these two goals were kind of contradicting each other. In the midst of me wanting to turn video creation into a career, I had this amazing idea to make a video with a little startup company that no one knows about, about being transgender. And I remember when I went into film um, this video, which was about pronouns, I thought to myself, who's gonna watch this video about pronouns? So the video goes up and it comes out really well and it reaches a bunch of people and the view count just gets higher and higher and higher and more people see it and more people are sharing it. And I start getting messages from people. I start getting these emails from people who have met me, you know, in the past two years who had no clue that I was trans. So people in general had a pretty positive reaction to that video, but the worst was yet to come. So at the time of me publishing this video, I was in a relationship and I was living with some of my partner's relatives and his relatives did not know that I was transgender. And when this video came in their feed to really over summarize the whole story, um, they were really uncomfortable with me living with them and they moved to evict both me and my partner. And I have to say that that was honestly one of the scariest points in my life because when I got evicted from the place that I lived with my partner, it was absolutely terrifying to recognize that my initial fears were not totally unfounded. But sometimes a good thing about hitting a low point in your life is recognizing that you can only go higher. And in that moment, I realized that one of the worst things that could have happened happened and I was still here. So that really truly was a turning point in my life. And 
I started to sort of attack YouTube and blogging with a lot more confidence. I started to actually make an effort to be a blogger, to be, you know, a person making content on the internet. And I'll be honest with you guys, I got a lot of scary stuff early on. I mean, I'm one of the only trans people on this platform and I've been on this platform since 2005. And um, a lot of people, who are trans YouTubers, they come on here and they're there for a couple of years and they disappear, but I'm one of the few that is stuck around. And, you know, even though YouTube makes me so uncomfortable, even though being on YouTube makes me so uncomfortable, I've learned that me being here touches so many people. I, I will never forget that I was speaking at UC Boulder, Colorado, and there was this trans guy who came up to me after one of my talks, and he told me that the video that I made where I spoke about pronouns was one of the things that helped him realize that he was transgender. And honestly, when I heard that, it made all of the scary experiences I've had with my eviction and the harassment that I've gotten on the internet, it honestly made it worth it. I became the representation that I desperately needed when I was a child. Even though sometimes it still terrifies me to be out, I know that being out means that I'm helping so many people. When you feel alone in this world, sometimes all you need is to know that there's others just like you. So don't ever underestimate the power of your words. Um, so that was all self-illustrated and self-animated by Kat. And again, another example of creating your own space in a space that doesn't um, escape. <laughs> That's okay. I'm trying to think how to go from... Sorry, click through this again. <laughs> Um, yeah, creating a space that isn't necessarily for you. Thank you for coming. Um, made space for you. Sadly, Kat said she left the animation industry. And, you know, I can't really blame her. It can be uh, frustrating at times. Um, when I was working for Ardman, um, I really had to push to celebrate Black History Month. Um, and it was the first time that the company, since they've, like, started, have celebrated it and same with um, Gutsy, the company I'm working for at the minute, they're Finnish owned. Um, I'm the only black person in the company um, and it feels like a big weight. Um, but just to reiterate, it feels like you have to be that person that you didn't have when you were a child. Um, here are a couple of honourable mentions. Um, so I encourage you to sort of take a snapshot of this and go away and have a little research. Um, we have Son Sonia Carey, who's an animation technology specialist. Pilla Newton, who's an animator and illustrator. Phoebe Boswell, a multimedia artist. Lizette Titra, vid a video game artist. Danielle Braithwaite-Shirley, who's an animator and artist. Karen Rupert Tolliver, who's a producer. And Jessica Nicole, who's an illustrator and voiceover artist. And Brianna Williams, who is an animator and podcast host. Um, yeah, I would encourage you to go away and have a look at all of these, um, especially because when I was studying here, I'm not sure what the course is like now or what the modules are like now, um, but so much of the material that I was given as a student was very sort of white male centric and reinforced the views and opinions that a lot of the white males on my course had. You know, I was often the only female in a group or the only black female in a group making films. Um, and it can be really hard to have your voice heard, so I think it's important that we diversify our references. Um, so for my final thoughts, um, I think we're currently living through, in animation, a sort of future history lesson with productions like Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, who's like Sony's constantly changing things up. Um, but there's a sort of hidden community of black women um, and, uh, sorry. And we need to sort of bring them to the forefront um, 
a bit more and keep that in mind when you're looking for references in work and in general um, because positive representation can shape our industry. Um, so that's me. Thank you for listening. Um, if anybody has any questions or anything, then I'll be around. If anyone has any questions, use the microphone. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Any questions for Lydia? Because um, I, as, a, as, a, as a white male academic, I've taught introduction to history of animation to film students and film screen studies here at Fast Bar. And I've been very conscious of you know, talking about the Disney industry and yeah. kind of the, the, the gender division of roles, mm -hmm. and also the kind of invisibility of race and ethnic difference within Disney, and kind of the kind of very difficult um, and how long it's taken very prominent people to receive recognition. Floyd Norman. Someone Absolutely, yeah. Floyd's a massive one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Disney animator. But I haven't actually, that hasn't changed how I did the lecture. So um, I wanted to know whether there are particular resources or uh, organisations you've come across in terms of that history that mm. you, you felt have really kind of been pioneering and, and helped to address that, um, uh, and that invisibility. In terms of resources, it's kind of been a bit, my research has been a bit higgledy piggledy. I mean, Here's some of the <laughs> sources that I've used. It's just been a lot of um, Google searching, reading loads of different articles. Um, again, like you said, Floyd Norman was like such a massive, you know, played such a massive part in Disney. Um, and yet, it's hard to find a lot of information about these people. Um, so, unfortunately, I can't point, point you to one specific place. Um, but um, Toon Boom, actually, Toon Boom has a lot of interesting articles. Um, yeah. And there are some great kind of animation history scholars who are doing that work as well. Yeah. So yeah, for sure. So I was just interested to see what, kind of, what you've drawn <laughs> on in terms of reaching back to kind of those kinds of figures. Yeah. Um, again, like I said, it's been lots of reading lots of different articles and pulling things out um, but yeah I really wanted to focus I think on uh, especially black women today because I think my journey into it is a bit unorthodox like I said I'm not I didn't study animation um, I don't I'm not an animator but I definitely have a creative side and I love seeing that side of things and what we put on screen for children is very important to me um, Thanks for the That's all right. Thank That's you. Really That's okay. No worries. Um, I have another question over there. Hello. Um, with your experience in film and media, yes. how, um, not enthusiastic, how important is it to producers, um, film directors, and generally people who make decisions on what content is going to be put out on media, how important is it that stories by people of colour and about people of colour are put out? That's a really hard one. I'm kind of at a mid-level position in my career and just from my own experiences with having conversations with, um, I'm at a company now where I'm, I'm really fortunate that the, my producer, my executive producer, will have these open conversations with me. Um, and people genuinely do want to improve and they do want to understand. Um, but it's a really hard thing to pinpoint how exactly to get those stories onto screen. Like if you just approach Disney, for example, like with an idea, it's probably not going to happen. Um, so it's a really tricky one. I think it starts, 
it's, it's really hard to pinpoint where it starts in the cycle. I mean, if anybody has any like ideas of where it starts in the cycle, because I'm like, I'm like, there needs to be representation on everywhere, commissioning levels as well. Yeah, right? absolutely. And, and a lot of production companies will say, oh, we've got, um, you know, we've got diversity targets and we've met them all, and uh, we, you know, this is our percentages, but. Actually, what's more interesting is really where those percentages lie. So yeah. if that's a pool of runners, well, they're never in a position where they can, you know, um, uh, kind of influence ideas, influence yes. conversations. So yeah. I think there needs to be a greater visibility in terms of commissioning editors and executive producers. And yeah. that's where, when you get diversity then at that level, then that's that feeds happens. down the chain. But if you've just got diversity on, on lower levels, mm. it's going to be much, there's, it's just going to stop, isn't it? Those yeah. Conversations and yeah, that's 100% right. I mean, this is just, this is pulled from the study I referenced earlier, and it's just about women. Um, but, oh, where is it? It shows that often the career progression does kind of stop you. Oh, where is it? Where are they? There is, a, there is a graphic somewhere. <laughs> um, I'll just leave it up here. But, um, so 7% yeah. of the story, see that, that then is you're going to have a very kind of mono story, aren't yeah. you? Because you're not, you haven't got any diversity there. Yeah, exactly. So that's, yeah, I think that is where the spotlight needs to be on those senior levels. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. At the end of the day, unfortunately, me pushing for Black History Month celebrations at work doesn't, um, yeah, change what gets commissioned at my company, which is sad. But and I always feel as well, it's um, the kind of it, it's a real shame that it's always kind of seems to be the reliance on the voice of those who are in the minority yeah. to amplify kind of what is important, like having a Black History Month, and actually, mm. it's almost taking up a lot of time. I'm sure a lot of your time in your space to be that advocate and actually it should be the responsibility of everyone and not just those in the minority and I think that's, I think we all got a lot to learn from that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's, it's a tricky one because I'm, I'm very like, very passionate about it. And I think sometimes people can feel they're a bit awkward or that they shouldn't step on that, but actually that's not, how progression's made if we don't like work together in that way. Um, so it's tackling that mindset really that people should get involved and people should speak out. Again, respect your voice and all that. <laughs> um, but yeah. Right. Thanks, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.